podcast. So welcome everyone, everybody. I'm Ari Masudi. I am uh, the host of Episteme Entrepreneur. Uh, that is a media, a podcast, uh, a blog, a vlog dedicated to deep tech uh, startups, uh, to scientists, and to, of course, scientists who found uh, deep tech startups. And today I have uh, uh, the pleasure to have a great guest. Uh, but before, I would like to, to thank and to introduce a great co-host today that has, who has accepted to join me and to, to back me in this exercise, uh, Benjamin Del Sol, uh, who is a quantum physicist, he's an IP expert, IP, IP lawyer. Uh, maybe, Benjamin, you would like to, to preside your own presentation because if I, if yes, I do thanks. that, I will... I will <laughs> no, it's perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I have a PhD in quantum nanoelectronics. Uh, my PhD was about uh, superconducting qubits. So I know a lot about quantum computing. And, uh, and now I'm a deep tech patent attorney uh, with a strategic vision of intellectual property. And I do also business and innovation consulting. And I have my own firm, which is Del Sol IP. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. And I see that uh, Guillaume Palacio that is also joining us. Uh, Guillaume, if you if you have, uh, uh, oh great, here we have uh, Guillaume. Hello Guillaume, how are you? Hey, hi, I'm fine, and you? Uh, we, perfect, we were, we were just uh, making the, the tour de table, the, the, the round table to present each, each other. So Guillaume is also a um, theoretical physicist by training, he has a PhD, and he's a serial tech entrepreneur, he's the CEO of a uh, of a painkiller, a startup dedicated to 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 offer uh, a solution against uh, chronic pain. Uh, Guillaume, if you want to precise your presentation, please. Uh, hi everyone. So so the meeting is in English, I suppose. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. No problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, my name my bio my bio is accurate. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, so yeah, um, former physicist. Um, condensed matter theory, uh, integrable models, this kind of stuff. Uh, with that, a passion for quantum information. I published a couple of papers on the subject, but more on the entanglement and quantum phase transition uh, um, type of things. And uh, very happy to join you uh, to uh, moderate this uh, <laughs> this um, this event. And um, I guess we also have heard that you are going to talk. Uh, Manuel or Rodolphe yeah? um, about uh, quantum machine learning and the subject I'm very excited about. Thanks, thank, thanks for joining us, uh, Guillaume. So, just I, I, I will, I will of course introduce you, introduce uh, our great guest today. Uh, so, um, Manuel Rudolph uh, is a PhD candidate in physics at uh, Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne in Switzerland. He's working on quantum machine learning algorithms. Uh, at the laboratory of quantum information and computation led by Professor uh, Zoe Holmes. Uh, how are you? How are you, Emmanuel? <laughs> are you I'm ready? I'm great, thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. So just as a warm up, uh, maybe I would like to ask you some question about your, your backstory, uh, where you grew up and why did you choose to, to, to study science? And, and why physics in particular, and how you committed in this exciting field that is uh, uh, quantum physics and particularly quantum computing. Of course, I'm happy to um, to chat a bit. Um, so yeah, so I'm I'm from Germany, um, as you might not, might not hear from my accent, um, but I've recently moved to Switzerland to to do my PhD, um, and I've been so I've. Right, so my, my kind of bachelor and master's was also in physics uh, with a focus on quantum physics always, but let's say um, I've been committedly um, working on um, kind of in this field of quantum, quantum information and quantum computing for the last um, like four and a half years, roughly. Um, but yeah, um, it, it, I guess it wasn't always like that. The, the, the fact that I found quantum computing is my, as it sounds cheesy, but as, as my passion, um, what, it wasn't always written in the stars for me. So um, in school, actually, physics was one of the subjects I hated most. <laughs> um, it's it's, I guess this is pretty uncommon. Like when when I share it, when I tell people, oh, I study physics, they're like, oh, 
okay, there's like, there's like two answers they say. Either they say, oh, I was actually quite good in physics. Or they say, oh, physics was the first subject I voted off, like the, the earliest I could. So like these are the two answers you always get when you when you say, you're, you're, I guess you're a physicist. But in my case, I actually also like really didn't like physics in school. And I don't, I don't know what it is about high school physics that I really disliked. Um, I mean, like it's all very important, like the mechanics, classical mechanics are super important. It's, it's interesting, but um, electronics, I guess I didn't really find interesting and I still don't. Um, that's just, but but the, the reason I actually got into physics was because um, one young um, teacher in our school had this interesting idea of mixing up the kind of learning patterns a little bit, not just kind of give you um, some content that you have to consume and kind of learn is um, he gave us projects that we should kind of like dig deeper, do some research on, and then present this as like a, a final presentation in front of the class. And the topic we, we I think we chose was, uh, was nuclear fusion. And um, so that was like 2011 or so, roughly. Um, so there was some information out there, but so we really dug pretty deep figuring out what what this is and and then we came to like quantum effects and all of that stuff and we're like oh damn like this is like this is way more interesting than than any of the other stuff and um i don't know so this this project really gave me this passion like this idea of uh well maybe physics is for me it's just not school physics so um after that project i really just uh have made it through school like school physics um and and then eventually um went to heidelberg to study physics knowing i wanted to do something like in the quantum the quantum realm um so it was really this kind of like one teacher that that um gave us the opportunity to learn a little beyond uh just the usual curriculum um yeah and I guess I, so. You asked me about the fam, my family background as well. Like, a lot of my, a lot of my family are, are scientists. Um, as far as I, no, I, I, as far as I can tell, um, there, there's a bunch of teachers. Like, they do they do languages. Um, so actually, a surprising amount of language teachers in my family. Like, both my mom and my sister and my aunt, they all teach languages. Um, for sciences, I guess I'm the only one. My my cousin. One of my Spanish cousins, actually, I'm half Spanish. Um, he he does computer sciences, and he says every time in the group chat and WhatsApp, he says like, oh, "I'm the only like he's the only person doing the uh, like pointing at me. He's the only person doing anything that's like real. All the others are just doing jobs, but like I'm the only one <laughs> keeping up the, which I think is a silly thing to say. Like, but um, yeah, so I guess I'm the only scientist in um, in my family, in my wider family. You you talk about language, of course, but uh, now with with powerful computer, but of course not yet with the quantum computing, but maybe one day with very powerful computer uh, and computer scientists and and uh, and and mathematician, we um, we can we can decipher you know old language and help uh, human science to to progress. So there is no uh, this kind of you know barrier between the hard science and soft science. Hard science are 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 now entering to the soft side and helping them to to become more strong uh, and and discover things you know how many old language we discovered thanks to mathematics and and computer science such as sumerian and lamit etc so j just yeah, just a, was a... It's an interesting point yeah uh, um i think i mean probably so the, these kind of ability you probably need you need abstractions to, to bring um, fields together and these abstractions take time. Um, so and I think a bunch of the, so just think about how much time it takes for um, kind of new technology to be simple enough so that your grandparents could use them, right? Like my grandparents could use them. So this, um, and eventually, yes, like eventually then language, um, like language teachers will utilize technology and technology will aid teachers in in transporting knowledge but all of this takes a lot of time and like and, quant and just like the role of quantum computing right um right now it needs a bunch of physicists um in like i don't know and um 
and engineers, like right, hundred percent. And then in like I don't know, like how many years it will need like more and more software developers, right, that are able to into in the kind of kind of transition between the layers of the like super um, concrete kind of like physical system and the more abstract high level language that people like everyone could speak essentially, right, and interact with a quantum computer. So yeah, this all takes time, but no, I definitely agree. I, I, um, I, I if people make it like a very hard uh, judgment distinction between like natural sciences and other things, I always try to like say like, no, that's, that's just silly. Everyone does their thing. And uh, so, okay, you enter at uh, university in phys and you studied physics, but you know, physics is like chemistry or it's like uh, biology, you know, behind the, the term physics, chemistry or biology, there are, there are many, many specialties, many, many uh, subjects of research. So why and how did you find your way to, to quantum physics and quantum computing? Because uh, you could have ended in studying astrophysics or I don't know, in uh, material science, or I don't know, there are many, many subjects in physics. So why, why this, this field in particular? Yeah, no, that's that's right. Um, I, so I think to a particular extent, I can't tell you why I find quantum physics uh, more interesting than other things. But one of the things that I do find interesting about it, um, and I, I think this is what um, is also parallel in, in nuclear um, nuclear fusion. It's like the 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 fact that that these like in, like intrinsically it just like purely quantum systems can somehow be leveraged to have impact in real life right like this is something that that like that i found that that is the thing that i found like crazy about nuclear fusion like you you do physics and then suddenly it just helps people it's like what right that, that's that's that was crazy to me um so for kind of for the the opposite reason um i didn't like um pure maths too much, right? It, it felt like it didn't have too much, um, like, relevance. I, I'm like a pretty high level person, high level in terms of, I, I, I live with intuition, kind of a story, you need a goal. And I um, I think with quantum mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics, with quantum computing, that's definitely there. Um, but then of course, um, I'm not a salesperson. I'm still, I still want to be a good scientist. Um, so yeah, so that that's one of the things that I really liked about quantum, quantum computing, that there is this this um, hint towards towards reality. Um, yeah, I mean this also, but this also of course exists in other domains, right? In chemistry, um, like you can make the case that that kind of like in in like um, having good um, like in like drug discovery um, or like drug synthesis, um, this is all like super, like extremely relevant, right? Biological research, um, to like cure diseases, to have like some foundation, like my girlfriend, for example, she does um, brain cancer research. Um, it has like, right? So for me, that's, that that also fulfills all of these things that I, I get excited about, but they, for some reason, I just enjoy quantum mechanics. Um, can't tell you like much more why. Yeah, and and then you of course apply for for a PhD candid, can, uh, for a PhD program at the at the Professor Zoe. Uh, um, sorry, I, I forgot her last name. Zoe, Zoe Holmes. Holmes. Yeah. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, and um, uh, so now you are you are in the. Um, how is it? How is it your everyday uh, as a? Because I know how how is. Uh, uh, the day of a, of a molecular biologist, you know, we have a white suit and we, we kill rats. <laughs> and but what you do in in your day, you know, so it's very interesting to to, to understand how uh, physicists work uh, in the lab. Yeah, I, I think I think you would be surprised by how boring it seems on the on the or like how normal it seems on the forefront. I mean, I just I get into the office, right? Um, usually, I'm not the first one. I, I'm more, I, I sleep in a little more than my other PhD colleague or a postdoc. And then I either have some simulation code. I'm more like a numerics oriented person, a simulation code that I have that I um, need to develop to work towards some simulation. Uh, or um, in the, at the moment, we're also writing up um, a manuscript. 
but it's always like essentially you have some you have some um just like personal tasks that you work towards just for me myself it's it's with my laptop i just sit in front of my laptop most of the day um and every now and then when we when we think okay our project as a group needs to be a real um like the um focus needs to be realigned we get together we discuss stuff um like draw on the blackboards and then we sit down again on, onto our laptops um but this pro but this thing of actually getting together and discussing on the blackboard and having a like really um both like super high level and low level discussions very fluently i think this is yeah this is something that i knew i wanted um and and, and one of the reasons I actually came back from previous job um, at a quantum computing startup, um, which wasn't in person also, um, I knew I wanted this kind of like interactive, dynamic kind of like growth um, environment. But still, a lot of the time, I'm mostly sitting on my computer doing simulations or writing writing paper. <laughs> uh, Benjamin, Guillaume, if you have any question for this uh, warm up, uh, le let's. Uh, you have the mic. Mm. Yes, yes. No, not so much questions. Uh, your journey into the quantum real realm is quite interesting because it's it's not uh, common. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, usually you 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 go to quantum field because you are you. Yeah, it's. I think it's something you decide quite young in the in your journey at the un university. Usually. Not always, of course. So no, your journey is quite interesting, and uh, and then, yes, your description of uh, a PhD day—it's uh, yeah, it's like that, clearly like that. That's what it is, yeah. <laughs> Unless you have some experiment to do uh, in the lab or stuff like that. Otherwise, yeah, it's your laptop, your best friend, and and of course some headphones, and and yeah. <laughs> That's true. I really recommend having good headphones. As a, yes, yes, like, very good. Yeah. Noise cancelling, active, and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. So um, maybe Guillaume, if you have a question for that this moment, or maybe we can. Uh... Um. Yeah. Maybe for later. I mean, the, yeah. I recognize myself in what you said. Uh, the PhD life, especially if you are a theorist. Uh, myself, I was not even uh, touching my laptop. Because, uh, <laughs> Just writing. Uh, my my best friend was actually my blackboard. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, it, if you do a numerics, yeah, I think it's it's basically the, this life, and um, it's actually um, it's actually very interesting because um, maybe you will mention this at some point, Ari, because I know this is one of your favorite topic. But uh, actually, the transition between uh, the life of a PhD doing um, a numerical work like in uh, machine learning, etc., um, to the startup world is actually very smooth because um, it's also very intense, very intellectually challenging, and uh, a lot of computing. So actually, those people who have these PhDs in hardcore science and hardcore uh, numerics, quantum computer science, these kind of things, usually become extremely valuable assets uh, for startups company, and you know. The kind of Manuel would be typically the kind of guy I would like to hire if I if I start my my quantum computing venture. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> Let's keep in touch. We can we, we can discuss this afterwards. Benjamin we, uh, will yeah, study. I, mean, I want to, to talk about your PhD subject. And Benjamin will 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 back you know your everything yeah. that uh, is about the IP. So <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Your most valuable mm -hmm. asset after your team is your IP, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, but one of the things that I really wanted to, um, so of course it will it will be a little technical because otherwise talking about quantum mechanics without being a little precise is is basically just wrong. Like it, you can't be not wrong if you don't if you aren't a little technical at least. But my my biggest hope is that is that, that there is something in it for everyone um so i've i've given a version of this presentation which was way like, com like completely no technical um to to people at the co-working place where i was working while i was remotely working for the quantum computing startup um and um essentially it was all built to inform and mostly dehype as well because i think the less you know about quantum computing the the more you think do crazy things about it um i think rarely the opposite happens where 
Yeah, I mean, your your background is is a representative, I think. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, but so um, I, I appreciate that that this is co-hosted by two physics experts. I hope I hope I'm not uh, like digging a trap for myself by by doing like make like wrong statements, but I'm I'm trying to keep it um, fair for everyone. Please, you can start uh, to share the screen and. And and uh, I would like to say to to the audience and people who join it, uh, do not hesitate to to ask your question in the chat uh, section, uh, and I will uh, I will uh, interrupt and I will ask the question uh, to Manuel. Okay. Yeah, I think you should be seeing the slide, right? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Um, okay. Good. So. So please do interrupt. I mean, this I I don't want to view the thing yet. Um, that's so. If you have any questions, if you have any conversation, want to have any conversation about what I'm saying, anything comes to mind, or if any people write something in chat, um, please do chime in. Um, yeah, but so this is this is kind of the. I found this so funny when I saw this. Um, who who have, does anyone of you have? Uh, has anyone have, um, did anyone see this kind of news? This wasn't very recent. This was a couple of years ago. But has anyone seen this before? No, nope, not this not. one. No, not this one. Not this one. So, so one thing that's very much missing in this picture is actually the date. <laughs> um, because yeah, this is obviously a joke. And and the interesting thing is that not everyone knows. Um, I mean, most people don't know enough about quantum computing or the state of quantum computing to even identify this as a joke. And so this, I think, is. Um, maybe dangerous is too hard of a word. Like it doesn't, um, like ma many things are directly dangerous. This isn't dangerous in that sense, but it's, 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 it's not good, right? Like, because, um, there's a lot of money on the line. There's like hopes, there's career paths, there's, um, also like political decisions that, that are made based off of possibly wrong understanding. And so it's, it's dangerous in that sense. Um, and a different kind of. A different kind of misinformation, let's say, is actually is actually true. So this is true, right? So this is a true um, headline that that this is kind of based off of a statement that IBM, um, who built quantum computers, um, actually made, and they so they promised, and then essentially they showed also a hundred times faster quantum computation in 2021, and so this is the kind of news that you that you read being probably realistically kind of uninformed or not interested in quantum computing. And you read this and think, oh, wait, quantum computers are in 2021, a hundred times faster than a regular computer. But this is what you, this is what you think after reading this. However, when, when I read this and I actually read the initial IBM Q statement, I was like, oh, this is, this is intentionally misleading because what they did is so this statement has nothing to do about their quantum, with the quantum computer. This statement is all about their software stack, their library interface in the quantum computer. And they made a specific application a hundred times less slow, right? This has nothing to do with the quantum computer. This is just their software is now a little less slow and their software is pretty slow. So it's not, it's not hard at all to make it a hundred times faster. Um, yeah, so this is just, this is the kind of news you do get, which is intentionally misleading for some reason or another. Um, but maybe just one person needs to be kind of like mean-spirited or ill-informed, and then the rest of the people and rest of the news outlets pick up on that, and then just they, they think that's true, right? That's kind of, that's kind of where the hype comes from. Um, and but the thing is, this hasn't. This isn't. This isn't uniquely to true for. I think this is something we also have to say. Um, I mean, we're living through this with AI right now as well. Um, but I mean, we we're just looking to kind of the conventional computers and how absolutely insanely useful they are right now. Um, like 60, 70 years ago, um, I think this was like in the 50s, um, right? So um, it was kind of the same thing. It was like huge machines that are basically useless. 
but it's like, oh, it's the computer age. Time to give up the paper route. Like I literally have paper here. Like so, this, this kind of this kind of hype has always been the thing. This kind of, um, hey, we just want to sell our letters, right? And also, and also the price, right? Like eight thousand five hundred dollars nowadays. This is actually more than fifty five thousand dollars, like inflation adjusted. So, and this computer is basically useless, right? So it's kind of it's. I see this as the same stage, roughly, like. Give and take quite a bit, but um, it's people. Are, it's basically a hope. It's a manifestation of hope, right? Plus some some like marketing bullshittery. Um, okay, so we have our computers right now. Um, we are sitting in front of them, right? And they're working great. Like they're actually they're good. Like we can. Um, they're not just quick, but the fact that they're already that they interface to the to the internet, you can. You can um, do your job with it. You can message your grandma with it. It's just great. Like it just works. Like you don't really have to worry about it. And so the question is, wh where do quantum computers fit in? Is it just that you slap them onto your desktop, right? Like is that the hope that you just replace your conventional computer with it and just say, okay, now just everything works faster? Um, actually, no. So it's that that is not the goal. Um, no one who works in quantum computing is going to. Uh, tell you that this is the goal and that this will happen. Um, so I'm not saying it won't ever happen because I think it's, yeah, you, you, just because you don't think it, ca it can happen doesn't mean it can't happen. So let's be a little humble here, but this is not the goal. The goal is not to replace your conventional computer. Um, but what is, so what is this, what is this? It does feel like a step forward in a way, right? So you have your computer and you, Take a step forward to a quantum computer, but what's different about it? Well, kind of the thing that that that's always um, brought up is kind of this difference between a bit, which is like the this basic computational unit in a in a, in a classical processor. Classical just means everything that isn't quantum in the, in the quantum language, right? So classical just means normal, normal computer, um, right? So this this processing unit. unit um, essentially, always only has two states. It has kind of, essentially it's it's an electrical circuits. It's the charge not charge state. Right? So like you either have you either have a um, you either um, have a um, what's the word in English? Never mind. So it's either charged not charged zero or one. Um, in the quantum in the quantum case, you also have a you now have a different kind of processor. It's not electrical circuits exactly encoding your uh, processing unit. It's actually it's actually these kind of processors controlling the environment for a quantum processing unit, which is a which is a qubit. Right? So so this is all like kind of these all these fancy images with like you can see it here, right? Like this is this is actually electrical uh, an electrical chip, uh, but the actual qubits are, are these these are super superconducting qubits, and they and they um, represent um, kind of the quantum processing unit, which which kind of this is how how it goes can not only be in zero or one meaning if you have this if you have this picture of coins and this is your European presentation I'm sorry about the Swiss people here um, it's not just like um, you have a euro that's like um, heads or tails right it's kind of this superposition state um, that isn't it's so one thing that physicists care a lot about it's not it's not both states at the same time. It's in a state that is a superposition of zero and one. Um, so that's its own state. It's, an, it's its own state that's kind of a superposition between zero and one. But let's get a little more. Let's get a little bit more into what um, people like me uh, work with, and and then and then explain kind of the principles underlying this. So this is something that you might have seen if you play with IBM a bit with their with their quantum computer interface and quantum circuit interface interface because this is the level of programming that researchers quantum computing researchers work with. Uh, this we literally so we have a qubit here and a qubit here, and we just we we just we just manually putting operations onto these qubits, um, which is which is. Which is stuff that was done in the thirties, right? It was classical computers, just manually putting operations there that that bring the calculation forward. And so this is a quantum circuit that consists of uh, three parts that I want to touch on today. 
So it's the one qubit system. So, so what is what is one qubit kind of mathematically look like, and what is what is an operation on that qubit? Um, then the same with two, and this is where this entanglement, um, um, this this um, where entanglement comes in between qubits. And then we have the measurement, because the measurement is something that the measurement just by itself is the reason why why you need to be very careful with quantum computing height. Um, it's super crucial, but interestingly, for the application that that but for um, what I'm working on, it's actually also kind of a resource. But that's but that if we have time, we can talk about that later. So so if you just have one qubit, and these these so these two blocks that they're, they're gates, they're quantum gates. So quantum gates are essentially they are um, sometimes they have. Um, they have analogs on a, quant on, a, on a classical processor. For example, an X gate um, is also called a NOT gate. And what that means is it just flips your, it, it kind of, it, it turns the state around from zero to one or from one to zero. That also has kind of a quantum equivalent, um, um, but we usually kind of relax this operation by, by a continuous kind of flip. So we don't have to flip the entire way. We can also flip a little bit only. Um, and I also go, already gave you this picture of of this of this sphere, right? Um, that a qubit represents, um, that it can be like anywhere in between the zero and one. Um, and so the Z rotation is actually something that does not have a classical analog. And what that means it's it's not just like going either up or down in that way. It's now introducing a rotation on the equator. And so, so this one doesn't have classical analog. But okay, so, so these are two quantum gates that we're applying to a qubit, and in 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 the kind of um, very far very far adopted um, kind of um, Dirac notation of which just take the symbols um, it's kind of like symbols. It's called a it's called a ket, but take this kind of form of bracket. But let's just say the quantum state of the qubit afterwards, which is here usually be denoted by this kind of Greek psi letter, um, is when we take initiate first our qubit at the zero state, right? So like a qubit down, then apply this, this rotation, um, this kind of continuous flip rotation by some, by some angle, and then apply another rotation by some angle. And rotation is actually the keyword, because if we, if we look at one of the of the um, representations of a quantum gate, it's actually rotations. It's really rotations, exactly that. So one, one, so you can, one, another way of representing um, the state of a qubit is by having kind of the down state represented as one zero, like a two dimensional vector, and the up state as zero one. But let's say we start with zero state, which is one zero, and then we apply a matrix which is a rotation matrix, right? So it's a cosine, sine, minus sine, sine, a cosine, and another rotation matrix. So these are both rotation matrix matrices. And they're in fact, they're called unitary matrices. They're unitary because they're essentially, they're reversible um, and they maintain the norm of the input vector. So, so that is just to say they're, they're, they're rotation matrices. They're regis rotation matrices. So, um, I'm not going to, like, I haven't explained why this is all true, but what I want to essentially um, convince you of is that the state of, a, of, a, of one qubit can be represented as a, as a two-dimensional vector. Um, then operations on that qubit are represented as rotation matrices. Then you multiply them together. You get an output vector with kind of entries alpha and beta. And because this is a unit vector, right, it has, has norm one, and you apply gates that only rotate, they don't change the norm, then also this output state is a norm one vector, which means kind of you have this constraint of alpha, of alpha absolute square plus beta absolute square equals one. Now, why absolute square? Absolute square, because you see this here, this is, a, this is an I, right? this is an imaginary number, so it's it's not these aren't real valued rotations. These are complex valued rotations. 
And so the state of a qubit is a complex valued two dimensional vector with norm one. That is essentially the definition of a, of a, of a, of a, of a qubit state. So let, let's, let's, let's step a little bit back from the, from the, um, math again, maths again. So what is a qubit? Is it magic? No, it's, it's a, it's a two dimensional normalized vector and a quantum computer that kind of acts, acts operation, like acts on this qubit, um, just induces a rotation of this, of this vector. And, and at the end, we have an output state. Like that is what a quantum computer does. It multiplies these matrices onto this state. Another question is, um, well, do we, do we really have, as developers, do we really need to know exactly by how much should we rotate this, this kind of like state of the qubit each time? And do we have to like set everything manually? Well, um, you, you could, it's a bad idea. You could. Um, probably in the in the next kind of years we will develop higher level ideas. But as of now, instead of manually fixing these these parameters theta and phi that parameterize these rotations, what we usually currently do is we we parameterize them, um, we we optimize them, right? So we what we do is we pick some sort of um, loss function, cost functions, some sort of objective functions, all the same names, different names for the same thing, um, that our qubits, our qubit state at the end is supposed to minimize. And so, it's, and that just means we, we kind of turn the knobs on these individual gates. So we turn the thetas and, out, and the phi's, we turn it up and down and see which of the output states at the end optimize this kind of loss function. So we, 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 give kind of a template of this circuit into the program with three parameters, and then we optimize the three parameters um, to maximize some sort of loss function. And if, and if, you, if you're aware of this, then you already hear that this sounds exactly like machine learning. And it so is. It, so here you're talking, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, by the way. Mm -hmm. Of course. So here you are talking, you are talking about le learning, uh, learning mechanisms because uh, if you do um, things which are more deterministic in quantum computing, and correct me if I'm wrong, then you will have the sequences of gates which are perfectly well defined, like yes. uh, a bunch of uh, pi, uh, pi over two pulses, etc., or Adamar gates and synods. So, to, so if you want to to make a phase estimation or or factorize a large a large number. So here you here you are parameterizing your gates because you have the idea of doing some learning afterwards. Am I right? Yeah. So there's a lot of so first yes, you're totally right. Um, the original the original kind of hallmark algorithms for which quantum com where quantum computers should kind of shine and be useful, right? So exponential speed up and so on, um, and in factorization or like quadratic. Um, quadratic speed up in in, in um, search problems, so this kind of so these kind of algorithms they they have a component they they, they yes they are fixed in stone in a sense right the this the quantum circuit that needs to be executed is defined from the beginning yeah? there's not it just needs to be executed and this execution is actually what is also classically intractable, um, but. The, the thing is, so these are so-called um, far term or fault tolerant algorithms. They are not fault tolerant because they are tolerant to faults, like to errors in your quantum computing. They're fault tolerant because they require a quantum computer that is fault tolerant. So they require a perfect quantum computer. And one of the, one of the kind of characteristics of such fault tolerant algorithms is that they are pretty redundant in a way, like you, they, they are very explicit, like every step is like very explicitly spelled out first this operation, then this operation, then this operation, then this operation, because that's the way we have been able to, to like actually write down and conceptualize these algorithms. But um, when it comes to today's capabilities, or let's say the near term capabilities in the next years, um, we require applications of uh, and, and therefore quantum circuits that are as short as possible, as compact as possible, so that they still actually solve some tasks that you're interested in, 
but with the least number of operations. Um, and this is something that we probably only know how to optimize. We, we can't, we can't, I mean, this, yeah, right. So, so there, yeah, so what you're saying is right. There is a huge class of algorithms that is kind of like set in stone. You just need to execute it. Um, and that's kind of this kind of far term regime, um, but it does exist. Um, yeah, in this kind of near-term regime, it's it's almost always about actually um, having some sort of variational component. Maybe then at the end with some sort of um, um, kind of like fixed in stone component to maybe enhance the results with some kind of great distribution. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I, I yeah, so I'm of course dropping a lot of a lot of um, information left left and right. But this is exactly um, exact, exactly right, as you say. There is much more than this. Um, but just to get to to the two qubit system quickly, because if you um, if you understand two qubit systems, then you also understand kind of um, how how it is for three and four and four and five qubits. So if you have your two qubits, if you have two two qubits, and you first act kind of like these single qubit gates independently in each qubit. Um, Okay, sure. We, we have covered that before, and now we have this this so-called C not gate. So this is a, so this is just some symbol um, that says if this qubit here is in the zero state, don't do anything to the other qubit. But if this qubit is in the one state, then also then flip the other qubit. So it's a controlled not gate. It's controlled by the state of this qubit, and it's and and then if if it's kind of like a positive control, then it flips, then it applies this not gate that flips the other qubit. Now, but because everything, right, and so kind of like in this in this formulation, like you have an Rx, Rz on the qubits, and then you have the C not like from zero to one, which just means zero controls one. Um, but because we've just talked about everything not being zero or one, right? Like the qubit here, like this, this this task of hey flip this other qubit if you're a one seems very discrete, right? But because we are actually not discrete here, um, what that what that means is that the that each so the 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 qubit one here is flipped is flipped in according to what the what the what how much of the qubit zero was in either the zero or the one state. So it's kind of a continuous rotation. So these two rotations were, were there before already. And this rotation here is now, this is now the, the matrix, the four by four matrix, and as opposed to the two by two matrix for single qubit rotations. It's the four by four matrix that has the ones and zeros just so that if you now multiply it with a vector, which is now a four dimensional vector, in a way that it, the, the entries here are like one, uh, this is the zero, zero state, this is the zero, one state, this is the one, zero state, and this is the one, one state. And each of kind of their individual contributions in this superposition, um, if we now multiply these together, you actually have exactly this effect, this logical effect of flip this qubit by how much this qubit is in state one. Um, and so what's re but but still this is now a four dimensional vector so so now the the pattern actually is it's two to the number of qubits so if it's 10 qubits it's 10 000, it's it's 1024 um dimensional vector right so it's 2 4 8 16 32 uh, 64 128 256 512 1024 it's like the the, the powers of 2 Every time you add a new qubit into the system and you start entangling it with another qubit um, in the system, what that means is you're doubling this size of this vector. And when you now, uh, um, when you just when you tell your quantum computer with your high level interface to apply a gate onto this onto your qubits, what that means is you need to now multiply a two to the n, two to the power of n times two to the power of n matrix, right? Onto your two to the power of n size vector, just so you get back your two to the power of n vector as the output. 
right? So you start with a zero state, apply your single qubit gate, apply the C naught, and at the end you have a, a, a size four vector and still everything needs to be normalized. This is really like the gist of, of, of um, quantum computation of like kind of like these, of idealized quantum computation that these transformations perf perfectly um, retain the norm of the input vector and the input vector needs to be a normalized state kind of by definition otherwise it's not a quantum state um, and yeah so right so now now you have this output vector so what does this mean so this is so this is the this this number here is a complex number but it, it tells you how much of the state is is in the zero zero state this tells you how much of the state is in the zero one state and this is the one one uh, one zero and one one state. So what? So that means you can actually now know. So that this is what what's called entanglement in a way that that these numbers are you, you have control over these independent numbers. The only condition is that their absolute that their norm equals equals one. But each of these numbers can be independent it, it, given this constraint, and so you can actually no longer then think about two qubits. Individ like as individuals anymore. This is now kind of a shared. This is a this is a state. This is one quantum state containing two qubits. This is different than two one qubit state states. And so, one one example could be a state that is zero zero plus one one plus kind of the no times the normalization to actually have this equal to one. So what that means is here alpha would be essentially square root of 0 0.5, right? So this would be 0 0.5. So alpha zero zero would be square root of that. And alpha one, oops, alpha one one would be square root of 0 0.5. And the other two would be zero. That is, that is the vector that corresponds to the zero zero plus one one state. And there is no way you can get this as a result of multiplying two qubits with their own zero and one amplitudes together. This is this is really a state that's uniquely quantum in that sense. Um, and it's called the Bell state, in case you've heard about heard of that. Um, okay, so but just to recap, because I really want to emphasize this, the quantum computer um, it contains a state, a quantum state that is kind of essentially represented by a two to the power of n, n being the number of qubits vector, it applies a two to the power of n by two to the power of n matrix onto it, essentially in linear time, right? Even though it's an exponential space um, and you get an exponentially large two to the power of n vector. So it looks like, and this is kind of where a lot of the magic comes from of, of quantum computation. It looks like you can just apply gates, which are essentially huge matrices, to huge vectors and get huge vectors as outcomes. Right? It looks like quantum computers just do everything exponentially faster. Um, and so it is true that quantum computation is a superset of classical computation. Like you, you, you could like everything you can do with a classical computer, you can also do with a quantum computer if you have perfect quantum computer. However, that that that, that does not mean that the quantum computer does it better. Um, or does it faster? It just means you can also do it with a quantum computer. And there exists things that a quantum computer could do that a classical computer could not do. And the reason is because these matrices that they, they, uh, you're multiplying and these vectors that you're multiplying them to are exponentially large. And, and the fact that you have like complex numbers here, so like you have all these so-called phases between the between the amplitudes and you can do a lot of really interesting stuff with that. But yeah, so this is what quantum computers do. However, now comes the measurement. And maybe maybe you have heard this from someone that um, when you look at a quantum state, um, it it collapses, right? So is the moon even there if, if, we, if we don't look at it? This is kind of the saying. And um, so the double slit experiment is maybe something that people have actually learned in school. Um, and it's 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 exactly um, a case of this measurement phenomenon in, in quantum mechanics, because if we so if we have this if we have this here it's a two qubit state 
right? So n equals two, so it's four dimensional vector. Um, with this normalization constraint, okay, sure. How do we actually get this result from the quantum computer? How do we get it back? Right? Because we initialize odd qubits at zero. That seems easy enough conceptually. We tell the quantum computer to do some gates. Okay, we don't know how that works, but let's say it just does it. How do we get the state out? Right? Like, how do we read out the information of, at the end? And the only way we know how to do that, and the only way, it's 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 like essentially axiomatic. It's basically an axiom of quantum mechanics. The only way we can do that is by observing it um, with a classical kind of being us um, observant, which by definition destroys the state. It's really weird. It's kind of a little bit like a cyclical definition because it's a phenomenon that happens, but we use that as a definition of quantum mechanics. Really interesting. And there's a lot of kind of philosoph philosophical discussion about how to best interpret this kind of measurement phenomenon. But, but really in practice, what that means is um, we have this upper vector here. And now if we ask our quantum computer, give me the result, it will give me either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1 for these two, two, two qubits with this probability. So every time, so I really have to run, and then the state is destroyed. The state is destroyed now. So I need to run this entire circuit. Let's say I have several repetition of these blocks. Then I measure, and then I get zero, zero. I'm like, okay, is this, so is zero, zero the result of the computation? You don't know, you don't know. You have to run the entire thing again, and now it gives you one, one. I'm like, okay, is that the result now? Zero, zero, and one, one? But no, now you have to run it again. And again, and again, and again, and again. And every time you get a different outcome, it doesn't have to be different, but you get one of those outcomes with exactly this probability. Idealized, of course, there's errors, but with exactly this probability. And, and so, yes, quantum computers are the machines that multiply exponentially large matrices with exponentially large vectors, which kind of seems to have given them extreme power. However, the only way you can actually access this is by this extreme, by this probabilistic outcome, um, by this probabilistic kind of um, recording of, of outcomes, and then you can, you can, and then from this, if you really cared about the the entries of these vectors, like these these alphas, you would have to complete. You record. You need to record all the measurement outcomes, and not only do you need to take the square root to like. Of, of your probabilities to take, fill them back in here. But actually, I told you that these are complex numbers. So the square root of the, of the absolute square is a probability. So it's a real number, like 0.3, right? The square root of that is a little bit bigger. So it's like, uh, like 0.55, let's say. Uh, it might be right, roughly. Um, but that's a real number. But the square root actually has many solutions. Right uh, in, in the complex value space, so you actually need to do additional work that I'm not going to tell you about here. Additional work to really get out the 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 the, the full vector here, and in in total, that's actually exponentially expensive. So yes, the quantum computer itself can do can do um, things that we couldn't that we couldn't simulate, but but it it can't be anything because we know that it only does this normalized entry at input vectors. And we also know that the operations it is based off of are only unitary rotations. So that limits what it actually does. Okay. But even if, if you find a way to encode your problem into the quantum computer and you find exactly the right circuit to, to execute on the quantum computer, now you need to run it many, many, many times because you only get stochastic access at the result. And finding out the full output vector is still exponentially expensive. So, so, so what you're learning, yeah. what you're learning is probability distribution. Like. Yes, and so this is yeah, and so this is exactly the segue. So this is until now, this is pretty general introduction to to quantum computing, but this is actually exactly what I use in my work, um, because for most applications, this collapse of the wave function is a detriment, but not in generative machine learning. Because so it's like it's all it's kind of like all um, 
it's, it's all in the news, right? Like with natural language processing, it's all about generative machine learning. M many people don't even know this term generative machine learning, even if they know, if they know like ChatGPT and stuff. But yes, this is one form of it. It's you, 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 your model, your machine learning model has learned some sort of probability distribution. And when asked to provide you kind of a an output, it gives you an output. Um, right, so this is what this what, what has been done in also like an image generation, what has been done in molecular discovery, time series simulation, lump, it's too too much, to, right? It's too many because so it's like the okay the actual applications in industry I actually don't know exactly how how really practical they are. I mean I'm sh I'm sure like molecular discovery has some applications that you wouldn't have gotten without um, without the help of this machine learning these machine learning algorithms, but to be honest, a lot of the um, generative applications um, are more like scientists uh, playing around. I mean, like image generation, of course, you can imagine this eventually becoming like a product together with some 3D rendering, and I don't know. But like, the field is still young. The, the actual field is still young. Um, it's just been exploding in the last years. But yeah, so the, the, this enti the entire concept is you learn a distribution over measurement outcomes and you measure. Like this is what a generative machine learning model is. And it seems like it's exactly what I told you. And that's actually true. So this is kind of the most, um, like let's say like foundational motivation I can give you to use quantum co computers for generative modeling is because essentially they're de like the definition of what you can do on a quantum computer seems to always exactly be the definition of what you want from a generative model. You want to learn these alphas, by like three parameters here, so that now your, your outcomes have a specific probability distribution. And every time you ask your model to provide you a sample, it gives you a sample with exactly its probability. So it seems, it seems exactly made for this. And so the model that, that one uses, uh, that at least I use, um, there's basically two models only. So this is this is the I think center one. Um, our quantum circuit born machines, which is just a complicated name for saying it's a parameterized quantum circuit. You have several qubits here. Um, you act you act a quantum circuit, and so this kind of big blob essentially consists of single qubit gates, two qubit gates everywhere in different patterns and repetitions. Each of those have like some parameters by how much you rotate. Because think, of, because remember, uh, a multi-qubit state is still is now a high-dimensional vector, a high-dimensional vector that you rotate, and you can't really imagine it. But so it's still all rotations. Um, well, this actually should have should this should point towards this blue, blue box, but I guess I messed this one up. Um, right, and so at the end. We get a get a like a vector here, which represents the quantum state of the qubits after applying this, this this these operations, and the probability of measuring any kind of zero or one is given by the like given by the absolute square of any of these numbers. And so when you actually so when you actually take a data set that that represents a distribution over these over these uh, zeros and ones, right? So like zero, zero has a certain probability of appearing. Here actually has basically no, no, no probability. Then four zeros and one is like a little bit and so on. And so like here, so you see these are like two peaks, two continuous peaks. And if I order my, my so-called bit strings um, in this bin binary fashion, right? Like zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero, and so on. So this is just a this is just an arbitrary ordering, but let's just say our training set of our data set coming in from the real world. Of course, this isn't yeah, but like um, data set coming in from the real world um, could be was actually this. Like you, the probability of observing this bit string here is four percent. The probability of observing this bit string here is thirteen percent. But the probability of observing a couple here are like zero percent. Like you never observe them. And so you you find a loss function that you that you can use so that so that the samples coming from your quantum model now fit 
fit this training distribution, fit the data distribution. Now this doesn't seem to fit. And the reason is we didn't, we didn't add enough repetitions of these gate blocks. Essentially we don't have enough free parameters. Um, if, if we had more parameters, right, it's deeper circuits is kind of a, a fr is, is kind of what people say when they mean more gates, like more operations. So deeper quantum circuits with more gates give you more flexibility in in the distributions that you can encode. A little so bit you, like uh, for neural networks, if you have like it's exactly like a neural network. It's just that the model is is a quantum circuit. Yeah. Okay, so the, 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 the data in your training set is classical or quantum? Here it's classical data. So it's it's actually discrete data. So um, data, one way yeah. to, yeah, so it's discrete data. Um, that, and it's actually very hard for classical models um, to have a continuous parameterization over discrete outcomes. Um, and the reason is that this usually wouldn't be diff like this wouldn't be diff differentiable, and so you couldn't train a neural network easily usually to do these kind of uh, things. Yeah, with with gradient descent and and back propagation. Yeah, yeah, but but you can actually do that. You, right, so it's I mean, okay. So the actual advantages and disadvantages there's there is there is a bunch of disadvantages of doing this, but conceptually, um, the value of using this kind of model is that you can use basically the definition of quantum mechanics and quantum computers as a resource. So when you when you want a sample to be generated, want a new output, it just gives it to you with exactly the right probability. Um, and that's something that the classical models really suffer from. They can't do well. Um, but this is just a very short, um, I think we're also like running kind of short on time. So this is just the kind of model that I use um and that we work on and just to give you a little bit about me um in terms of how i approach these things I, it's it's for me i sort of really want to pin this down what is a potential like what is a potential application of these quantum computers for generative models and that really requires us as a kind of community to understand the models like what what are their properties compared to existing classical models? And how can we actually like engineer improvements, right? like actually given our understanding. And so initially this is like two and a half years ago, we published um, we published a paper at my, um, which, was, which was my internship project at Zapata Computing, this quantum computing, sorry, startup. Um, and it was like an application together with with neural networks um, in like a demonstration that quantum computers can be used in kind of like a, in combination with, with classical networks. Um, then I really had this desire of understanding more what was going on in these kind of models. And so I, did, I actually developed a visualization library, a Python visualization library, it's open source. It's called OrcVis because Orchestra is the, um, is the product of, of my company, um, my previous employer and um, viz because of visualization. So we, right, so, I, so we developed this um, visualization algorithm that is supposed to help you um, understanding what these black boxy parameterized algorithms actually do. And we always published a paper on that. Um, then kind of this was the last project I, I, I did, uh, I led at, at, the, at, the, at Zapata which was combi another combination of classical methods with quantum methods. So there are ways of simulating quantum systems and quantum computers with classical computers. And, and the idea is that you can do most of the work with classical computers, but when you really think, when you really find out that, that the solution isn't good enough, um, we developed a, a technique to, to map the results of the classical simulation to a quantum circuit so that you can then kind of continue optimizing your system, uh, your quantum state on the quantum computer with additional resources. But you don't have to do everything on the quantum computer, which saves time, money, and everything. Um, then also an, um, a, an internship project with one of the interns I was supervising. Essentially, the question was, if data comes in, how do you best stru structure your model so that it's well equipped to learn from the data you're given? Right? And so this was a nice project. Um, a very recent project at my new group here at EPFL, 
is another application, which is actually for quantum physics. So this, everything until now has been kind of like application of quantum computers for the real world. And, and this is an, uh, an application paper for quantum computers for um, real physics. And the, and the idea is that you want to, um, you could, for example, learn, um, you could learn quantum processes that, that happen in quantum experiments um, by use of a quantum computer. So you can model kind of the, the process that's happening in a real experiment and, and build the circuit that, that mimics this kind of process on a quantum computer. So now you can actually study that process on a quantum computer and keep doing stuff with it. And um, another, another uh, so the paper that we're currently working on, more in the understanding direction again, um, and um, this, this is to come, but um, yeah, so this is, so yeah, I'm totally invested in, in quantum generative modeling, but I'm really trying to become a better physicist rather than um, just becoming good at programming, which I have been. I've been become I've been getting quite good at, at numerical simulations, but I really want to like have the full I wanna, wanna, not the full, but I I want to be a good physicist as well. Um, and I thought I would I would end with a with an FAQ style um, last slide, which is is Schrodinger's cat dead or alive? And the answer is yes. Is quantum mechanics mysterious magic? No. How much faster is, quantum, is a quantum computer? That's the wrong question. It's about scaling. So a quantum com if you, someone says to you, a quantum computer is faster than a classical computer, then they're probably wrong, um, like in general. But the question is for which application, like in which context? What, what, like what, what was the quantum computer doing that the classical computer couldn't have done? So but this leads to the question, Will it replace uh, normal computers? Right? Will, will everyone just use it? Will I play Quantum Minesweeper on my Firefox Quantum um, browser? The funny thing is actually, I superimpose two pictures here. So this is kind of like a superposition Minesweeper, but this is legit, like Firefox, <laughs> Firefox uh, has a version that's called Firefox Quantum, pretty funny. Um, and the answer is highly unlikely. Like, honestly, like it, the quantum computer isn't going to help you get to your emails like a nanosecond faster. That's not the type of applications, therefore. The type of applications, therefore, are really quantum computers are good at doing quantum physics, right? And learning about quantum physics, learning about quantum chemistry. That's also already a little bit more of a stretch because quantum chemistry, um, um, like the reality of quantum chemistry is is a lot more messy than, than these kind of idealized quantum physics um, uh, systems, but then okay, machine learning, finance, right? So, I would so I guess this would be the order in which I would, in which I would uh, put some of the main applications, possible applications. Um, when will they become useful for these tasks? Well, so for quantum physics, I could see like in the next years, five years, to, that they actually contribute to improve um, understanding to um, some uh, better more precise simulations for some quantum physics models, toy models, essentially. Um, for the other ones, I mean, let's see, right? I mean, I really, I'm really excited about this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, but let's not, I mean, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Like I compared, I compared the stuff that was happening to classical computing in the thirties and fifties and so on. Like this is, it's, it's still well on its way. And then finally, like who builds quantum computers in, in case you care? Um, Google, IBM are kind of uh, the leaders for superconducting qubits, and I think also in general. Um, then IonQ and Quantinium, they do um, trapped ion qubits. Uh, Psi Quantum Sanadu do um, photonic qubits. D Wave has an annealing, uh, an annealing um, hardware, which isn't really a quantum computer, but almost Microsoft is trying stuff with silicon based qubits because. The reality is we don't even know how to build the best qubits. Like there's so much we don't know. Like on the algorithm level, the engineering level per like for each implementation of a qubit, but we don't even know like what is the best implementation of a qubit. There are so many ways of building um, or trying to build a clean quantum two level system. And we, we, are, we haven't even decided which is the best yet. So. Um, let's, let's stay excited, but let's also stay out of um, silly hype.
Um, yeah, that's okay. That's basically the slides I have. Uh, I hope I hope this was useful to some of you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. We have already a question uh, by Jodos. Ariel, uh, please take the, take the mic. Uh, Ariel is a is a neuroscientist. She's a scholar. She's a studying neuroscience uh, in a PhD program. Hello, Ariel. Thanks. Thanks for taking the mic. Hey, uh, thank you so much. I'm on my phone. I do apologize, but thank you for such an interesting um, presentation. Um, so I'm here uh, because I'm working on some problems that, um, you know, what you presented today, like really ring true to the kinds of things I spend all of my time thinking about, um, specifically um, like multi AI pipelines where you have multimodal models with an aspect of real time. So thinking about a real time digital twin of a of like behavior, perception and action or stepping back and saying, OK, let's make a computational model of biological systems. So like, what can I see? What do I how do I physically move in some environment? Um, and then I'm looking at this in the context of neuro rehabilitation. So I'm kind of like really curious about how I can start getting more involved in in utilizing um, the interface between say like graph attention neural networks and um, you know, I'm, I'm just from someone with my background and skill set, just sort of some questions around like uh, how would I get started there to implement this within our multimodal, multi AI pipelines for like um, embodiment in virtual space as in neuro rehabilitation? So, definitely, there's a lot of information that I just shared. And uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, 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 okay, I have difficulties um, really connecting to the full spectrum of what you just told me. Um, but yeah, I do. So, so what? Yeah. So one thing is undoubtedly true. Um, this is all very much in its infancy, and what that means is that yes, there are being um, interfaces built to 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 um, work with quantum computers, but I don't think we are yet at a level where we even know um, how to best. So how will com quantum computers be addressed in the future? Right. So what is the type of query that you give? To send you to, to your quantum computer and what is the kind of output you get so for example you could so right i told you about all of these individual gates no person that is outside quantum wants to know about that they just have they have a problem right and they want a solution so 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 to whatever quantum program you're setting you you've said you constructed um you, the input needs to be pretty abstract probably and the output needs to be in direct accordance to like it needs to be an answer to that problem right and so we are very far away currently from uh, having these kind of sophisticated interfaces but there are so for example Sabata, my my previous employer um one of the things that they that they um that they um market is being quantum ready so essentially you will you will want a, an entire software pipeline where um, it, you do your normal routine as, as usual, and then eventually, once quantum computers catch up, you can just plug that in. Just press the button, send this to quantum computer, and and receive solution, whatever that means. And the reality is, we aren't there yet in terms of the sophistication. Like we aren't. Um, it's it's not the problem of the quantum computers necessarily. Um, which also aren't there yet, but um, it's a pretty high risk to even develop these interfaces and put a lot of money into it because it might just change, right? So it's, um, I, I think, so I, I don't know how, how many people or resources you have at your, your disposal, but if you're really interested in, in quantum computing and how it might be um, affecting your, your business in the future, I would recommend to have maybe like to like either hire a consultant or hire a full time person whose job it is to like be good at and keeping up with the literature and just be honest to you, right? Like be honest mm -hmm. to you what the current status is, what the status is going to be the next the next time, and to inform you about your decisions. Um, but right I, as of right now, I would say it's it's um, it's I would not look to. I wouldn't if yeah if I had to prioritize 
um, no. I would not try to build a quantum pipeline. No, for sure. I mean, I, I guess I'm familiar. I'm, I have some in the space that I share some of the time. There's a, a kind of a startup that's working on. It's called Titan ML. Maybe you've heard of it, but they kind of use. So. Yeah, so they're kind of like initially they were using um, these methods in like vision problems, and now they're doing it in large, like compressing large language models, um, where you just like embed high dimensional vectors into something more manageable. Um, you know, operationally, I guess. And so hmm. these kinds of um, kind of like borrowing ideas from quantum computing and implementing them into um, the kind of ML that we're using today is maybe one approach, like almost on a theoretical level. And that's where I like resonate so much, you know, like even something hmm. simple, like the dimensional space of the four limbs, you know, legs and arms, you know, like bringing it to a very like embodied perspective. I, I, I work in embodiment. Yeah. Right. So, um, I mean, one in, one really interesting um, field that grew out of quantum computing, that came out of quantum computing, is is the field of quantum inspired algorithms. Um, what that means is that there are classical algorithms that have that that usually they were actually used to study quantum systems, but it turns out you can also use them for other stuff. And and from what you're telling me, I presume the people um, from Titan ML, um, they might be using tensor networks. They, they tensor order... network... Sorry? Oh, yeah, sorry. Tensor networks and like the matrix propagation. I can't remember the other exactly. matrix product states. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. And then I guess correct. Yes. So these are algorithms which are, which actually are, um, I should go back. Um, so, so this is, this is essentially, so I work with tensor networks. Um, and they are actually running on a laptop, like they're running on some classical cluster, right? But they are so close to, conceptually so close uh, to quantum systems because they were originally developed to study quantum systems with laptop, um, right. that they actually can be mapped to a quantum system back, right? they can be mapped back. However, even by themselves, they can be very powerful. So this is what people are realizing. Oh, now there's like a new idea which came out of quantum, Quantum, um, quantum mechanics, um, which grew out of it, kind of, it's it's a standalone solution possibly, um, but yeah. But interestingly, if your if your pipeline actually is based on tensor networks, there is a non-zero chance that that you can eventually snippet out the the tensor network and replace it by a quantum computing component because of. And this is what this work actually demonstrates: you can map from one to the other and back. Um, but but yeah. Please continue. Yeah. So, um, but but I know I'm I'm a really big enthusiast with with um, tensor networks. Um, I think they're great. I think they're really great. They borrow the best of both worlds. You have um, you have physical insight. So because they're so close to quantum, uh, quantum systems, you can learn about them much more than you could about some black box neural network with like dozens of layers everywhere. Like non linearities you can't make predictions about them. You can't really probe and understand what they're doing, but but you can actually probe and understand what tensor networks are doing, which is super valuable. And at the same time, um, they are actually uh, they actually represent a quantum state, where you can represent a quantum state at least, um, that that you have classical access to, which means you don't need to measure and gather the stochastic evidence you just have the, you know, all of these alphas, alphas I was telling you in this large vector. You can just read them off. They're all they're all encoded in the classical in the classical model. So you kind of have the best of both, both worlds in a way. They're definitely definitely very restricted in what they can do. With very restricted, I mean, um, you can always cook up some example that that breaks them, um, especially in quantum physics. Like they, you, there's this no free lunch. Like there's there's no you, we, we know we basically expect that there's no um, general purpose classical algorithm that sim can simulate all quantum physics, um, um, like in in beyond, like before the world ends, like time wise. Um, but at the same time, you can also cook up some super synthetic data set for some machine learning application where where um, where tensor network fail. But um, they're definitely a great first try and like. If if you're quantum curious and want to be quantum ready, like I think having experts that work with that 
And eventually when quantum computers come along, like you can think about integrating that. I think that's a great, a great I, strategy. It, it's interesting because I'm not coming at this from a like, I'm interested in quantum computing, but it's more like theoretically, it's just what appears to best describe the problem that I'm working on. Not, be, you know, like mm. um, that makes sense. And even like in some of the, like the versions of our, um, you know, application that we have now, it's only possible. It, it's only possible to kind of make what we're building accessible by utilizing these kinds of methods. You know, because you have to compress things down. You just have to. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, okay, quantum computers aren't natively about compression, and really, I wouldn't say um, tensor network tensor networks. Um, do fit in there better, I would say, because because the only way tensor networks can simulate quantum systems to a certain extent is because they have compressed everything down by throwing out a lot of the redundant information. Um, so quantum computers themselves aren't that much about compression, I would say. Um, it's more that you have to kind of compress your problem down so that quantum computers can actually tackle it nowadays because they're so small, relatively speaking. So, but um, <laughs> two kinds of compression, I guess. Yeah. I do what it want. I guess like uh, you wouldn't want to come. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. Um, yeah. But I also, of... I also don't know your exact application. I'm, I'm probably I'm probably just um, rambling because I, I don't know mo enough about your application to be useful here. <laughs> no, but that was really helpful in general, and I'm uh, grateful for the presentation. And I um, I will just continue. And certainly, like tensor networks at, at this stage are like make a lot of sense for a lot of applications so i agree so, yeah yeah thank you. Enjoyed it. yeah thank, thank you. you uh maybe i have a, a question uh you 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 see that the different technology that are uh, in competition you know uh and developed by different company big company or startups uh they are those who are based on photons those based on electrons those based on atoms and do you think that they are really in competition, like you know the old school technology uh, that were in competition and one one win, one won, and and other uh, lost? Um, or do you think that all these technologies can can at the end collaborate together into a bigger you know kind of super system, uh, you know to back each other's uh, to back each other weakness? Um... Yeah, so I, I do think that that there is a certain form of complementary, um, complementariness is that a thing? Um, complementary <laughs> uh, between the different hardwares. Um, so at least as of now, I would say super so superconducting qubits are the the fastest have the fastest cycle time from what we know, like from the kind of devices we know. Um, on the other hand, they have basically the lowest fidelities. Um, comes conceptually, um, which means that their gates have more errors than, than, for example, trapped ion gates. However, trapped ion gates are orders of magnitude slower. So there might be there might be applications where it also trapped ion gates actually enable multi qubit operations, and also neutral atom, atom com computers, which I haven't mentioned here. They not just a C not gate, for example, which which acts between two qubits, but gates which act on like a bunch of qubits at once. So it's like a much more complicated um, evolution. Um, so there and and this is something that superconducting qubits do not natively offer, for example. So so they do have their advantages and disadvantages. And I could I could imagine a world where all of the technologies are are um, developed enough to a point where it now makes a difference which you send your algorithm to. I can tot I can totally imagine that this this kind of trend of strengths and weaknesses keeps up. However, realistically, the the, the first technology that will break through to be useful is probably the one that everyone will jump on. Right? It's kind of this um and then who's going to want to finance the other technology that's still useless um but i mean i mean maybe there is like maybe they have a way to like market their potential advantages compared to the other technology that kind of broke through so 
yeah, so can, I, I do agree that I, I can totally imagine this world um, where the different implementations of qubits, all of them kind of, uh, most of them, many of them stay, or like some of them stay, and they have different uses. But I don't see how the the flow of actual like the market would. Um, I don't see how that would really happen, and unless two break through at the same time or several break through at the same time, I would. I think the first that becomes um, useful is probably going to kill a lot of the in, uh, interest in the others. Um, but I mean, I could be co totally wrong. Um, I hope I'm wrong because I think it's interesting to have this kind of trade off. Guillaume, Benjamin, is you, did you have? Do you have uh, some question to end uh, this session? No, not no questions. Just I, I have to leave in in less than five minutes. So, just to say that uh, thank you very much, Manuel. What well, that was a great presentation. I have seen a lot of presentation uh, about this subject, but this one was quite interesting because uh, it was clear, simple, and at the same time with enough detail to be accurate. So it's not always a, a, like that. So thank you very much. Thank you. That means I... love coming from a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit more enthusiastic uh, than you, I think, about applications uh, because of my connection with the uh, industry. Uh, I see already some direct application of, um, of quantum computing uh, technologies. And, uh, and, and that's funny because my today post on LinkedIn was about tensorized neural network and the applications and, and, and about, of course, quantum inspired algorithm and the comparison also with, uh, with quantum computing and classical computing. And it's very interesting because uh, depending of the use case and the complexity of the use case, most of the time you are okay with classical computer. But uh, it's only when it's become very difficult when the number of parameters, for example, is very high, that you need and we have an advantage using a quantum computer. But uh, so, so for me, the comparison between classical computing and quantum computing, from my point of view of these use cases, it's like uh, Newton and, and, and Einstein. I mean, you, you have the classical mechanics and you have the relativity. And it's the same. Most of the time, <coughs> classical mechanics works perfectly. You don't need to use relativity to calculate basic stuff. But yes, when you are, want, uh, when you have a situation more complex, uh, you, you will need quantum computing. So yeah, very very interesting. Uh, we keep in touch because I uh, I think we have a lot of uh, to discuss. And but I have to leave. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank on. you, Ari. Thank you. Uh, the audience also, and uh, and see you soon. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Guillaume, Guillaume, do you have a last question maybe for for Manuel? Uh, yeah, I had, I had actually two two short questions. One is technical, and not sure it will interest. Uh, it will be of interest to to all of us. Um, and one is uh, yeah about the the, the application of uh, um, of learning of quantum learning uh, algorithms. So my first question, technical. I I know the answer, but I would like to to have your your, your take on this. Um, enfin, I know the answer. I know some answers. Um, so the you... trick question that only that that, <laughs> that is meant to like find my ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so um, you presented essentially uh, learning algorithms um, in your in your presentation. Uh, with this like uh, uh, variational gates, etc. Uh, yeah, exactly. But like this, this, uh, this uh, born machine. Um, so uh, quantum mechanics is inherently um, uh, linear because you apply uh, linear gates and uh, and matrices, etc., etc. Uh, yet for some uh, problems like uh, um, high dimensional classification, this kind of stuff, you need non-linearity. And uh, you know the classical neural networks are very powerful because uh, you basically encapsulate nonlinearities into nonlinearities and are able to um, uh, to uh, to um, to reveal some uh, very complex uh, shapes and uh, um, and patterns in the data. So how do you do this uh, with uh, with quantum uh, algorithms? This is the first question, and the second question is of course. What are the application of these types of very specific uh, class of algorithms? 
yeah no these are these are if if you get a little bit into the um classical machine literature um and you all and you know a little bit of quantum qml or the other way around um this is this is the question i i um i hear a lot um yes so these models are linear what that so the 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 meaning of linearity here in this context i don't i don't see a direct way of making this clear to I, I don't think this yeah so for the purposes of this let's let's just say that yeah so these can because it's all rotations right that 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 quantum computers um can implement in general um it it restricts the type of transformations that you can do um you can you can you can actually implement nonlinear transformations on a subsystem of qubits by transforming a kind of this kind of rotation on many qubits but then doing some funky stuff with some of the qubits and just keeping the rest of them so that there there is way to kind of like break this trend of just being able to rotate which is like linear right linear meaning you can rotate by a bit and then by another bit which is the same as rotating for the full angle at once um and this is something that yes that the classical neural networks um actually they they are nonlinear and so that seems to come with a that seems to come with um, more power, that they actually are able to represent more stuff. But it also means that they effectively, you basically can't make really well-founded statements about their promise, like how, how, like how promising, um, what, the proper, what the properties of the model are, um, if you can prove some sort of um, convergence, um, if you can prove some sort of trainability, um, maybe, but so only in the most simple cases of neural networks, um, maybe where there's like one linearity in the model, you can still make kind of rigorous statements about them. And because quantum systems are linear and, and also like the, 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 the theory is, 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 is enormous body and it's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's essentially everyone believes it's basically correct. Um, you can make much more rigorous statements about a model that is formulated as a quantum model because because of because everything is much more um on much more well-founded grounds in, in this linear model for example also in 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 um tensor networks if you use them for the same application as a as a um, neural network you can put you can prove more you can actually say more and study more about the actual properties either empirically or or um, also especially uh, theoretically of the tensor network as compared to the classical network because nonlinearities mess up all the maths. Okay, so does that mean that these models, they might, does that mean that they are weaker? Um, so in generative modeling, I'm pretty convinced no. Uh, and the fact is that the measurement is not linear. The measurement alone um, is at, it's at least one nonlinearity in this model. Because yeah, so what it means is I can't measure I can't measure yeah this 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 collapse right a collapse is non measure is non linear um, and so for generative models I'm pretty convinced that this um, does not play a role that this that this doesn't come back to shoot them in the in the in the neo how do how do you, how, how do you say that never mind um, to bite them not to shoot them <laughs> um, but in if you use quantum circuits for classification, I think there we do really see the impact of this because there is there are very simple models, classical models that that have been shown to represent the outputs of a quantum classifier very well. And the reason is because the quantum classifier is just doing linear operations on your input. Right. So it's like a linear operations on your input gives some sort of prediction, but if you don't have non nonlinearities, you're very restricted in what it can represent. However, here in the generative model, you don't have input. You don't manipulate data. You you, you create data. And this is something that actually is uniquely quantum in a way. Um, for all the classical generative algorithms, you need an input, like a like some random number that you transform, and then it creates an image. Pure, like actual randomness that doesn't need any seed, any input to itself, doesn't really exist classically, and it's and it's kind of and it does. That is kind of the basis of this model. 
So what would be an application of such a model? So it is a continuous parameterization um, over a discrete outcome space, which means you, you need a discrete, you need discrete data. Um, it probably can't be too big um, just because at that point, probably neural network do it pretty well. But I think in this domain of like hundreds and thousands um, of, of discrete units, um, so if, if your data has kind of this, this type, um, I think there's an, a really strong niche for these kind of quantum generative models because they, they are powerful in capturing distributions. Um, it, there's nothing stopping them from learning more and more complicated distributions. Okay, there are limits actually, but they're more like qu quantum information limits. But yeah, but they're they very powerful. Um, and one of the greatest properties that I, I think is really undervalued here um, about them is this measurement really. Like getting a true sample from your distribution is, a, is not something that classical models do well. So um, it's, it's either expensive to sample a classical model or it's or you have a, some sort of bias in, in there, some sort of like imperfection that you aren't actually sampling from the true distribution. And quantum and quantum models give you that um, automatically. So yeah, in this domain of hundreds and thousands of, um, of discrete units, this definitely happens in finance applications. Um, mm -hmm. this, uh, this can happen in, in, in um, you know, these are like graph type applications, um, maybe, um, molecular discovery, something like this, um, I can totally, so th I mean, I'm not saying this is like the first application I might try because I, I also probably think also the applications are understudied because the classical capabilities weren't there so much. Um, yeah, but this is what I would say. Um, I hope this made sense <laughs> to your questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Perfect, so we are going to conclude uh just maybe i would like to add a point i think there is a maybe unexpected application of uh, quantum computing for single molecule um whatever <laughs> analyze calculation in bio in biological system because uh for example in in the biological system you have uh, um cations or onions that for a very fraction of time that can be in a quantum uh, state. Uh, I won't say more. We'll discuss this if you want uh, in a late in a later in the private. But this is a this is something that could really really uh, revolutionize uh, neurobiology. Uh, this is something I really believe in. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Thank you, Benjamin, uh, and thank you to all the audience for joining us, Manuel. It was very great to have you, and uh, the talk was very great and. Hope to see you soon, guys. Bye. <laughs> it's a pleasure, and uh, we should uh, connect on LinkedIn or something. Yeah, of course. Um, sure. I'm I'm called Manuel Rudolph, right? And if it's Manuel S. Rudolph, I'm on Twitter. I'm LinkedIn. Um, thanks for having me. Um, it was a lot of fun. Also gives me a gives me a lot of gives me a lot of practice also in sharing um, my my background and what I believe in, and I I really enjoy these kind of um, technical but informational get togethers of people that really want to understand something together so yeah thanks for having me i will of course uh, share all the links uh, in the in the in the article blogs and and everywhere and share the, the video online with the replay thank you guys bye bye bye, bye.